Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we are speaking today about the readings for Wednesday of the sixth week of Easter. Wow, this is exciting. We're getting late into the Easter season. Pentecost is coming up. We have also wonderful other feasts, maybe a little bit less than Pentecost, but nonetheless very significant. We got the Ascension coming up. Even the seventh uh, Sunday of Easter is a really significant occasion. I know most of the country doesn't have a seventh Sunday of Easter because it gets preempted by Ascension Day being moved up onto the Sunday. But um, if you're in some of those few places where you do have a seventh Sunday, you are really blessed because there, there are fantastic readings for that Sunday. It's kind of the climactic Sunday of the Easter season where you read from the high priestly prayer of Jesus, John 17, one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. And unfortunately, most of us never get to hear from it because Ascension Day always gets plopped on that Sunday obligation. But anyway, we won't go there. Today we're talking about the Wednesday of the sixth week of Easter. We're late in the Easter season, but getting geared up to renew that infilling of the Holy Spirit. And we've got a fantastic reading from Acts and from John that one-two combination that has been really doing it for us uh, throughout uh, this Easter season. So we have Acts 17 in the first reading, and we read about uh, Paul's famous speech at the Areopagus. Uh, the Areopagus, that translates as Mars Hill. Uh, it was a, a famous rock outcropping in Athens, big flat area, that in ancient times was used uh, to hear court cases. So famous, um, very dramatic court cases of homicides and so on were tried up on Mars Hill. And then later in the history of Athens, it became kind of a, a place of public forum where people could go to debate the latest ideas and so on. And that's how it was functioning as kind of a town square, if you will, uh, in the time of St. Paul. And so here is St. Paul. And it, this is so dramatic, okay? The book of Acts, by the way, is, is um, just an amazing window into the life of the ancient world. Uh, many of the figures that Paul interacts with in the book of Acts, we only know from the pages of Acts, and so we take them for granted. But they were the premier individuals, the, the, the celebrities of their day, all right? When, when, when uh, St. Paul speaks in front of Festus and Bernice and Agrippa and these other uh, politicians near the end of Acts, these were world-renowned statesmen, celebrities, models, in the case of some of these women, etc., that were famous in their own day. And here, Paul, um, you know, if you think about um, the movie uh, Forrest Gump, for example, uh, where this character played by Tom Hanks walks through uh, the 60s and he encounters a who's who's list of famous celebrities and politicians at that time, acts is like that with Paul. Paul waltzes through the first century world and encounters all these major figures. But here's a very special occasion because Paul is at at uh, Mars Hill in Athens, and he's standing, you know, in Athens, the place that was the scene for the teaching of Socrates, of Plato, of Aristotle, these famous philosophers and seekers after the truth who are still studied to this day, who established the Western tradition of philosophy that gave us natural science and, and such great uh, contributions to human thought and culture. So he's standing in this, in the birthplace, if you will, of Western intellectual thought, and he's now entering into this great conversation of the great minds that have followed in on the tradition of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and now he's going to preach the gospel in the place where these great Greek philosophers uh, gave their ideas. Plato you know, with his analogy of the cave and all these other kind of contributions to human thought. And what does Paul say in this environment? He says, You Athenians, I see that in every respect you are religious. As I walked around looking carefully at your shrines, I even discovered an altar inscribed 
to an unknown God. What therefore you unknowingly worship, I proclaim to you, because the God of Israel was as yet unknown to the Greek tradition. So he comes and proclaims this unknown God. And he goes on to talk about how God is the creator of all that has been made. He uses arguments from what we would call natural theology or um, even from natural science or from philosophy. He gives some basic arguments about God's nature that can appeal to anybody who uh, ponders uh, the revelation of God that is in the natural world. He talks about how uh, God as creator shouldn't be represented by idols. Um, and, uh, and he concludes by saying, God has overlooked the times of ignorance, that is all this foolishness of worshiping idols that has been going on for centuries. But now he demands that all people everywhere repent, this is the gospel, because he has established a day on which he will judge the world with justice through a man he has appointed and he has provided confirmation for all by raising him from the dead. So he concludes what began with natural philosophy and natural theology. He concludes with the proclamation of Christ risen from the dead. Wow! The gospel of Jesus Christ now encountering the great philosophical tradition of the ancient world. And we see in this a beautiful picture that the truth of the gospel okay, is the culmination of human wisdom. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were grasping towards truth. They, they hit upon monotheism, and they discovered some truths about God. But for Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, God was always a distant mind. Okay? He was perhaps the creator, uh, perhaps the one who established rationality in the world, and that rationality could be perceived by pondering uh, nature. But God, for Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, was never a father. God, for Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, was never one who became incarnate, who took on our flesh, understood our sorrows, entered into that kind of intimacy with us, even becomes our spouse, dare we say, and invites us into that passionate and personal relationship with himself. So Paul adds a dimension that the philosophers never could attain, that the truth they sought after is actually a person, a person who has become human and invites all of us into a relationship with us that will continue for eternity because he can raise the dead. Woo! Beyond human philosophy. So much more satisfying. So, so, so mind-blowing beyond the categories of simple rational thought. So this is our first reading. Paul preaching the gospel in Athens. And then, beautifully paired with it, from John 16, verses 12 through 15, look at what we have here. This is from the Last Supper discourse where Jesus is preaching about the Holy Spirit to the apostles. And he says, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth. See, truth is what Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were searching after. But truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ, but it's also the person of the Holy Spirit. We can also look at it that way, and that's the way Jesus is presenting it here. That truth is a person who is the Holy Spirit, and he's going to come. Uh, when he comes, the Spirit of Truth, Jesus says, he will guide you to all truth. So truth is not found merely by the machinations of human logic, but truth is a person who comes and indwells us when we enter into relationship with the triune God, we experience the sacraments and open ourselves through prayer. Truth is a person that indwells us and will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on what is uh, on his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me because he will take from me what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason I told you that he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is the church's ongoing teacher 
who resides in the church in in the heart of the church and as the church journeys through history and encounters innumerable problems and challenges that could not all be uh, uh, predicted because we cannot be given a book with an infinite number of instructions for every kind of circumstance that the church encounters through through millennia of history. Nonetheless, the Bible doesn't explicitly say how to deal with each of these circumstances, gives us fundamental principles, and then the Holy Spirit dwells within the church to, lie, to lead us and to guide us into a response, taking from the inexhaustible truth which, it, which resides in the Father and the Son and making it known to us, we the children of the Father, we the brothers of the Son, and filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we are led into all truth. And to this day, to the year 2020, the church still stands as a beacon of light, illuminating the human mind, teaching us the principles of ethics, teaching us how society ought to be guided, taking away the blindness that prevents us from seeing obvious things like that an unborn child is a human being, for example, and many others as well. And, and still, the Holy Spirit is what Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and every other philosopher was grasping after with the limits of human reason. What they are grasping for is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is true wisdom, who is the truth. So let's meditate on that on this Wednesday of the sixth week of Easter. And as we participate in Mass, perhaps really participating now, certainly in Steubenville, we are, as daily Masses have been opened up, we can take that Eucharist that is full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Godhead, take it into ourselves and pray to God that we be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, who is the perpetual teacher of the truth that all human philosophers have grasped after from the beginning of time. This is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville wishing you a blessed Wednesday of the sixth week of Easter.